Well, here we are. I'm going to get my ammo bag. All right. Here. Go right ahead, bud. Um, this, uh, uh, this is going to be an opportunity for us to interact with, with Ken Myers. He's been gracious enough to go over to Mitchell after these messages and spend considerable time uh, visiting. Yesterday he was there till well past 2. 3.30. 3.30 it was. <laughs> Uh, visiting, uh, and that, that is, and I've, you know, if you've ever done public speaking or especially conferences where you're back to back, and then you, and then you have people lined up who would love to visit with you, uh, the tendency is, you know, to have a rescuer, somebody to intercede to say, you know, uh, Mr. Myers really needs to go to his room now and get some rest. Uh, we did not have such a person appointed. <laughs> Uh, so he was there and, and, uh, and graciously uh, let, us, let us ask him questions. I was there for most of it, uh, but then I had to leave, and I abandoned him. <laughs> All right. We're going, to, uh, we're going to engage in a few questions. I have a couple to start us off, and I think one of the, one of the questions that I would like to explore, I'll, I, well, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to ask two or three questions. We'll get up to about 11-ish, and then I'm going to turn it over, and we can interact. We can have a conversation. Uh, first question. Uh, just practically speaking, are there some uh, uh, books that have been most influential to you on beauty, on shaping your concept of what constitutes beauty, and could you share those with us? Yeah. Um I'm still, after 40 years, trying to figure out the beauty thing, but uh, I think on imagination, if I could mm -hmm. answer the question I want to answer instead of the one you asked, uh, <laughs> I could be, have a career in politics. Um, <laughs> uh, years ago, Probably the late 60s, before I started reading these things, I was in high school, my dad renewed his subscription to Christianity Today magazine and got a free copy of a book by Thomas Howard mm -hmm. called An Antique Drum. And uh, a couple of years later, I stole it from him and never gave it back. And uh, it's now, it's still in print. It's called Chance of the Dance. And it's really on mm -hmm. imagination. I, I reread two chapters with a reading group at UVA. It's, it has, I won't go into why, it's, uh, it's cultural moment shows. I mean, that, that is when it was written is evident. But uh, he, that was, I think, one of the first books that really helped me understand the idea of imagination as th the recognition of, of likenesses, be, one thing to another, but also the idea that God has created the world so those likenesses will be perceived. We, we live in a world of abundant metaphors that are intentionally placed by God. Uh, I have a bumper sticker that says, poetry happens. Um, it's not currently on my pickup truck, but uh, I had- You drive a, a pickup truck? I drive a pickup truck, yeah. I have a chainsaw, actually. Do also, you? Yeah. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> and the scars to prove it. Um, almost. Uh, uh, yeah, I had, at a conference, I, I, was, I was talking about this idea that metaphors are embedded in reality, and God has created the world in such a way that uh, we find in the stuff of creation, like gold and honey in mm -hmm. Psalm 19. I think God gave us gold and honey in part to, communic to convey the what, the subjective experience that we have from golden honey, which can then, it's objectively there. The subjective experience is objectively there, and it's there for us to appropriate in poetry or in other forms. So uh, that, Howard's book was the first book that, that suggests that to me. I'm trying to think of which books by C.S. Lewis helped me start thinking about this, and I can't identify any one. Later, uh, much more recently, I read an essay. In fact, I had a copy with me. Uh, that you can get this online. George MacDonald, who I mentioned before, mm -hmm. who 
was instrumental in C.S. Lewis's own conversion, which counts for something, one mm -hmm. would think. Uh, an essay of his called The Imagination, Its Functions and Its Culture, and by culture he means cultivation. How do you cultivate or the imagination? And it's, it's one of the best short essays I've read uh, on this idea, again, that God has placed tangible, visible, sensory uh, experiences within creation which are suitable and uh, fitting for uh, the expression both of eternal realities but also of, of, of the deepest internal mm -hmm. realities and the connection between them. Uh, I think another book that I read, uh, like I said, I'm still working through the beauty thing, but on imagination, there's a book called Poetic Knowledge, which I think I probably cite in lecturing and writing more than almost any, called by a guy named James Taylor, not the singer guy. Um, Taylor, uh, it's, it's really a summary of uh, some really, really old ideas about how poetic expression uh, communicates, uh, and he makes the argument that uh, poetic expression is real knowledge. That is, it conveys real knowledge in a distinctive way that analytic, an analytic approach to reasoning does not convey. Mm -hmm. So uh, take that Psalm 19. Uh, there's this great shorthand that, that says that, that God's commands are like honey. You could spell out in an analytic uh, outline the nature of our response and our to, to God's commands uh, when, when we're rightly ordered. But to say that they're like honey jumps to the the nature of the of the reality. But mm -hmm. the point is that when when the likeness like that is made. Uh, the experience, it's, it, it's an actual experience of the, well, let's call it the form of honey mm -hmm. that, uh, that conveys the knowledge. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a propositional, discursive, analytic conclusion that we come to, but it's a, an, intuitive ex, uh, an intuitive knowledge, but it's real knowledge. But that, almost that's visceral, the there's, there's a kind of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a reality in that response that's immediate. Right, or, and it's immediate because of the fact that uh, the, the, the phrase that's used as early as Aquinas, it's co-natural. That is, mm. the experience of the aesthetic form is of the same nature as the thing that the form is describing. Mm. Mm. So if you want to write a poem describing the experience of softness. Uh, it'd be easier to write that in Italian than German. Uh, <laughs> I actually, years ago, when I was at NPR, produced an interview with uh, Jorge Luis Borges, a mm -hmm. great novelist, who said he, he loved writing poetry in English because it gave him a palate that he didn't have in his native tongue. I can't remember if he's Portuguese or Spanish. I think it was Spanish. Uh, yeah, he was Argentinian. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, because of the, the fact that you could take all of the mellifluous romance side of English with words like mellifluous, <laughs> and the stark, harsh, Germanic, monosyllabic side of English. And English has absorbed both the Romance and the kind of Anglo-Saxon Germanic, which tends to be, um, ha have a lot more Ks and, <laughs> and, and percussive consonants, and not the, the sweeter, more liquid consonants okay, and vowels. There's, there's, there's an okay. interesting um, uh, maybe point of contact with this. When Lewis was a young fellow sitting in his, of all places, doctor's office, and there happened to be a volume of uh, Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods, which is uh, sort of a, a composite of two of the, the literary expressions of Wagner's ring, actually Wagner based his ring trilogy on Siegfried, the stories of Siegfried and so on. 
uh, it was open to an illustration of the death of Brunhilde. Yeah. And he glanced at that as this young man. He saw that uh, with the illustrations by Rackham, Arthur Rackham. And he said, uh, my soul was embraced by Northerness and I never recovered. Now there's yeah. Wagner, you yeah. can't get more German. Right. Uh, and, but his, the, 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 the martial quality of Wagner is right. translated into this gorgeous illustration by Rackham, which then the poetic nature of that right. immersed yeah. Lewis. Yeah, so, so and, and if the illustration does justice to it, that's the key. Uh -huh. So if there is this experience of northernness, as he called it, which, which, can, which, has, which is a kind of uh, assembly of different mm -hmm. sensibilities and virtues and beliefs or vices, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to f a, a, an artist has to figure out how do I capture and convey mm. uh, those, so, those sensibilities so that the experience of line and color and shading has, uh, do, doesn't just uh, remind people intellectually mm -hmm. of those sensibilities, but actually is a little subset experience of the thing mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that idea is the, the, the term that Aquinas uses and that James Taylor in his book Poetic Knowledge uh, uses is co-natural co knowledge. It's so that Creative expression, at its best, captures the sense of the thing that's... It, the form matches the content would be a really simple way. Why didn't I think of that before? Um, I'll tell you another example of something I learned uh, when I uh, worked at NPR. Uh, I worked for years with a poet named John Chiardi. You may know his work, a minor, minor American poet. Uh, used to be very well known in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Died in the 80s. Uh, and Chiardi, when I was in high school, I used, uh, I used to read the Saturday Review of Literature. I was so nerdy. Uh, in, in 10th grade, I discovered a magazine called the Saturday Review of Literature, which is kind of like Harper's or the New Yorker today. There's really nothing like it today, actually. And suddenly, the, the whole world of art and culture and literature opened up to me that I had not been aware of. And I, I voraciously read this magazine, not understanding 95% of what they were talking about, but I knew it was very important. <laughs> and, uh, and I subscribed to it, and I would clip the clever, witty cartoons, which were like New Yorker cartoons, mm. and pay, I had my whole wall. Other kids had posters of their favorite sports figures or uh, their you know, the bands they like. I had cartoons from the Saturday Review of <laughs> Literature. <laughs> it was a, this did not bode well. Uh, so, and there was a column in that by John Chiardi, uh, who I didn't know his work, called Manner of Speaking. And Chiardi had spent years researching the origins of various idiomatic expressions in English, slang terms. Uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea, for instance, or you know, all sorts of uh, uh, idioms and, and slang terms. And he would look at how uh, they were often misinterpreted, or there would be folk etymologies, mm -hmm. that is, uh, al alleged stories about where that came from, uh, and then what the most likely uh, real story is. Uh, I just was fascinated, because I was interested in language, uh, from pretty early age. Anyway, I proposed to NPR that they bring him in as a commentator. And we did a series, it was called A Word in Your Ear, that was a five minute weekly program, which when Morning Edition went on there, was then on Morning Edition once a week. And I worked with him regularly. And uh, Chiardi, I had actually, well, after high school, I, when I went to college, I read Dante's uh, Divine Comedy in John Chiardi's mm -hmm. Translation, which still is in print, and yeah, yeah, and that's how most people know of Chardy. Most people have never read his poetry, but they've read his translation uh, of Dante. The the translator's essay, the the, the introductory uh, essay in the Inferno volume, where where he explains the challenge of translating Dante from the Italian, 
and it is brilliant because it shows, again, it, it reveals from the inside how poetry functions mm -hmm. and how a translator has to recognize the nature of the functioning well beyond just doing justice to, to the lexical mm -hmm. meaning of the words. And I'll never forget one of the things he says that, um, that, that poetry, uh, he says a, a good translator has to capture what he called the musculature of the poetry. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if a word, um, if, if a line has a lot of uh, sounds, a lot of S sounds and assonance, and, and, uh, and often you see this really good poet, uh, if you want to talk about snakes and slitherin and slithering, <laughs> you use hissing sounds regularly mm -hmm. throughout it. So he says, so if, if you've got, if the poet has been very deliberate, to use essentially percussive effects, mm -hmm. but also making your mouth do mm -hmm. something and your face do something. So that certain words, you're, you have to kind of grimace mm -hmm. when you say them. And other words, you know, if you have long open vowels, your face mm -hmm. is elongated. He says, that experience is part of the poem. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which you are dancing the poem when mm -hmm. you read it. And uh, he says a poet has to capture that sense so that what your body is doing is resonating with the emotion or the, you know, what's going on in the narrative as okay. well. And that's, that's another instance. And that, so I think that, that idea, uh, that's why I spent so much time talking about the incarnation mm -hmm. as because our bodies are involved in imagination, mm -hmm. un inescapably. Somebody I read not long ago, describe music, all music is virtual dance. That is, all music is inviting the body to do one thing or another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think all poetry does the same. And poetry has a similar, similar mm -hmm. thing. Even something like architecture invites mm -hmm. you, a good building invites you to walk through it. Mm -hmm. And to, you, you, obviously you experience the, 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 uh, a, a space mm -hmm. and the configuration of spaces and the use of light in that architecture yeah, you, you, to draw. You don't just perceive right. it with your eyes. Right. You perceive it with your whole mm -hmm. body. There is a, just to, to add on to the Dante reference, uh, for your edification, there is a, uh, there's a wonderful little book that, does, that not many people know about from, uh, from C.S. Lewis called The Discarded Image, uh, where he contrasts, uh, for example, Dante and Milton and their effect, their overall effect on the reading public and how those works shaped and reflected the theology of, of their times. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite, I'd love to know if Chiardi had an influence on or vice versa of Christopher Ricks, who is my favorite Miltonic scholar. He, if you find any works by Milton with notes by Christopher Ricks, his work in Paradise Lost is exquisite. If you had that C.S. Lewis's introduction or preface to Paradise Lost and Paradise Lost, you would have just about everything you need, I think, for really entering into, uh, into that work and then being able to contrast it with, with Dante's vastly different images of heaven and hell and, and, uh, and salvation. Uh, let's open it up sure. to uh, uh, folks. Please come to the mics and, uh, and ask your questions. All right, make your way. This is your time. Sarah, good to see you. Hi. Um, my question is, um, we can have art shows and we can have performances. Basically, you know, that's like the first step and talk about the redemptive quality of the imagination. What I want to know is, what is the next step? What kind of opportunities can we create to kind of give church membership, members like ownership of the arts? Yeah. Well... Um, that's going to depend a lot, you know, it's going to differ congregation to congregation, and it's going to differ in different denominational traditions to some extent, although probably not as much as the local difference. I mean, I think, uh, I don't want to, uh, this is, this is a big project, okay? Uh, uh, I was, uh, the, uh, as I said in my opening comments, uh, 20th century fundamentalists and evangelicals haven't typically been known for a strong commitment to these issues. But that, but that only reflects an even longer uh, kind of disconnect 
which is uh, part of the whole story of, of, of modern culture. And it's, I mean, beginning in the 18th century, beauty is divorced from truth and goodness. Uh, imagination is entirely subjectivized, that it's, it's totally personalized. It's not tied to creation. And, and the, the belief in an ordered creation starts to abandon. And Christians, oh, I didn't know, that, I never leave this on, and I never get calls. Um, so, uh, the, um, there, there, there's a lot of, it's like this field that's been left to go wild for a long time, and there's a lot of work to be done. I, I think that uh, one of the things I'm encouraged about is the work being done, I, the work being done in, in Christian schools. Mm. I think that if people, if, 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 if we wait, and I don't want to sound too fatalistic, but if you wait until people are in their 30s or 40s to start trying to get them to not just think about, but to have practices in their lives that encourage and nurture uh, attentive, imaginative life. Uh, it's, I'm not saying it's too late, but <laughs> it's really a lot to work against. And we can, how might we, uh, if you want to broach the subject, uh, in the local church context, train aesthetic judgments. Well, I, yeah, and, well, I, and I think, so the more that can be done with young children, the better, mm -hmm. and the more that can be done thoughtfully with young children to start with, the better. And, and that means, uh, um, I, I, I said in a <clears throat> comment to the faculty yesterday that we have largely turned over the shaping of our imag the mag imagination of our kids to mass media. And, and parents kind of instinctively say, well, let's get safe mass media at least. Let's get... But often it's only safe in terms of content. Um, it's not necessarily... Because often, sad to say, a lot... You know, my background, I am a mass media guy. <laughs> Uh, the only time I ever got fired from a job was working for a Christian radio station. Um, and it's partly because I was trying to do some unconventional things that I felt a Christian understanding of imagination ought to, uh, ought to pursue. Um, but those unconventional things weren't recognizably good by people whose attitude toward imagination had been shaped by secular mass media, by... That is, by skeptical or um, secularized mass media, let me put it that way. So, I, I'd say uh, fr from the time kids are really, really little, to expose them to uh, really good stories, and, not, and sto stories that are good not because they're moral, but stories that are good also because they're well-constructed mm -hmm. and artfully, uh, artfully told, uh, to expose them to... Uh, um, to, well, expose them to nature as much as possible mm -hmm. because I think creation is uh, the source the, of all uh, good imaginative uh, uh, life uh, and, and to, to, to good works in visual arts and, and in music also. Can I add one quick thing to this yeah. before I forget? Uh, Clifton Fadiman... It's an excellent anthology. It's called The World Treasury of Children's Literature, and it, it incorporates uh, nature. It is three volumes, and they are graduated according to the age of the child, and it's world literature uh, that is the best literature, uh, everything from Russian folk tales to, to, to American or British, European literature. Okay. Um, so, uh, so for kids, uh, uh, that's the first thing. I mean, I think, I, I think probably... Uh, the the biggest uh, the biggest hurdle to overcome may be uh, the the sense that people have that this is a, a kind of luxury or it's optional uh, or it's um, it's too feminine. <laughs> this is a problem that uh, oddly enough, I mean, uh, one of the problems in modern culture is the assumption that, oh, it's the subjective soft side of life. It's something that women, women will like. 
but not for us guys. We're going to do the ESPN thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wish there'd been better aesthetic choices made with promise keepers, for instance, uh, <laughs> to pick. Uh, so I think that, yeah, so there has to be some teaching. Practically, uh, you know, we've done stuff in our own church. Uh, I, I've done, um, well, I've done some lecturing on, on musical literacy, particularly. We've also done some things where we've taken, uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago during, uh, during Lent, during the period before Easter, we watched uh, a video of Bach's St. John Passion, and everybody had copies of the text with them. Uh, and we got a big screen and uh, had about 40 people from the church come out and watch, watch that. Um, so, uh, you know, you can do things like that. I, I, I think, um, I remember uh, a Sunday school class when I was in high school or college. I, I guess it was in college. Uh, at our church, uh, by, taught by one of the elders who, uh, who later went on to be a pastor, but who had really read C.S. Lewis's work. It was a, a class on Lewis and, and imagination, particularly. Uh, Lewis is always convenient because people trust him as, a, as an apologist, so, um, so you can talk about his view of imagination in that sense. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm hoping to, to start a project with Mars Hill Audio to create curricular material for small group study on, on music, musical literacy, on the nature of musical meaning. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we tend to think of music, I, again, I, I don't, we tend to think of music as pleasant noise, that, and we just look for the noise that we feel is most pleasant, uh, and that's how we select music. But the idea that music can convey meaning and, and uh, rec in some way, uh, we, we, are, we have been trained to be active non-listeners to music. We have so much music in the background in our lives. Uh, I can't believe it. I go to the gas station, there's music playing on these tinny, horrible speakers at, at the pump. Why do I need that? And, uh, so, and everywhere we go, we've got background music. And we, so we learn not to listen. And then, uh, and then most... Most people are multitaskers. They have music on in the background. Very few people I know ever sit just to listen to music and to attend to mm -hmm. what's going on in it. Uh, it's just something that's going on in the background. This really fits uh, uh, C.S. Lewis in, in um, the uh, screw tape letters so that if you want to distract the, your, your patient, the person who's being tempted, one of the best things that you can do is to fill his world with noise. Yeah, oh yeah. In fact, Screwtape says that, uh, in fact, that's a very pivotal letter because he says uh, that in the infernal regions of our father below, uh, great research has been going on and they made great progress in the development of more and more noise uh, because, uh, because he says there, there are two things one never experiences in the kingdom of our father below, music and silence. And... Uh, it's useful to remember that uh, uh, the capital of hell, does anybody know what the capital of hell in Milton's, isn't there kind of like a central pandemonium? pandemonium. Thank you yeah. very much. So, uh, so I think that, that active listening opportunities, uh, gu guided listening, I've, I've wondered for a long time, there are thousands and thousands of book groups where people read books and come to discuss them, but almost no music groups where people listen to music and then come and talk about the way, and not talk about the texts, the lyrics, but talk about the structure of the music and how it works or why, why it doesn't and work. And going into the, the negative, and we're, okay, we're going to get you, brother, so, I promise. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. The, the, let, me, let me ask one quick thing as a follow-up and then, and then come on in, all right? Uh, the, we need negatively, on the negative side, there needs to be a deterrence from these uh, as you have said, the trivializing forms of imaginative expression uh, to, to, in order to help shape the positive, there has to be a, some bit of restriction from those trivializing well, yeah. forms. yeah, I mean, I think we need to recognize, just as we recognize with junk food, yeah, right. that, that there, there are experiences which might be pleasant, yeah. <laughs> that, that might not be, uh, what, well, as St. Paul says, uh, all... All things are permissible, but not all 
not everything is edifying. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a question of, is it sinful for me to do this? It's a question of, th is this going to enrich my, imagina my imaginative life most fully? Yeah. Not so you, I can be an aesthete and so I can, uh, uh, you know, brag about it, but uh, because it's a, yeah. it's a blessing. Yeah. It's a good thing. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Myers is uh, it, it kind of goes more so towards storytelling uh, what would your advice be to storytellers whether it be uh, fiction whether it be um, film or move or music uh, that desire to paint the church um, with a consistent picture of, of what we would view as Christian doctrine uh, but not through polyanic lenses right. um, uh, for example um, some of uh, the church's activity where the contains with the Crusades or whatever that may be, but I guess in summary, how, how do we um, paint a portion of the church that leads to a perfect Christ uh, despite our own imperfections? Uh, in, in what setting are you talking about the storytelling? Um, I guess if, if you can comment, uh, whether it be from one church member to the church or uh, just uh, the church to the secular world yeah. in general. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that there's been a real recovery of the power of story and narrative in my lifetime, that people have more and more recognized that. Um, and so there are a lot of people who've, there are a lot of people who've uh, given instruction, and unfortunately none of the titles occur to me right away, on, on how, well, um, I think in some of Eugene Peterson's books, mm -hmm. Uh, I th probably in Take and Read and Eat This Book, two of his mm -hmm. books, uh, he comments on what, how stories work and how not to, uh, how not to let an effort at storytelling um, mutate into making an argument. This is, <laughs> this is why I've never tried my hand at fiction. I do not have... Uh, the discipline to, to, to stop making arguments um, and, and, and preaching. But uh, so, uh, so I, I, you know, there, there's lots of advice. I mean, I think that to, to appreciate the narrative structure of, of Scripture itself, first of all, the big story of Scripture. Uh, I grew up, I remember my grandmother's house, she had this little thing on the table, kitchen table, it was a little plastic thing in the shape of a loaf of bread that had these little cards with Bible verses on them, and you could kind of pick one at random and, and get a little uh, encouragement through a kind of random Bible verse. And it wasn't until I was in college that I realized that the Bible was a coherent book, because I had this kind of like lucky dip approach to the Bible for a long time, and that it was basically a, 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 a random collection of insights. Mm -hmm. So for, first of all, I, what that prevented me from seeing was that, it, that actually there was something you, you could call systematic theology. That is, there was something, that, there, there was systematic truth. But also that it was, and it took me longer to realize that it was actually, uh, it was the story of God's encounter. Well, it was the story of creation, fall, and redemption. And that we are still part of the same story. That... Uh, so I'd say to, you know, whenever, uh, whenever it's possible, and I think that for, for clergy, this, whenever they preach on an Old Testament text, the, the tendency, it seems to me, is to kind of try to take mm -hmm. some moralistic lesson uh, from the Old Testament text rather than setting the Old Testament text in question in the context of of Israel's whole history and how Israel's history leads into the history of Christ and the church. So, um, so I'd say attentiveness to the story that, that is already present there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question whether you really are interested in how we, whether we're, we're really attentive to the narrative or if, if, if you're asking how, how do we make our our lived out story really more faithful. Yeah, how is, how do we make it 
as yeah. sinners faithful. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, and I think that that's. Uh, I, I remember I interviewed. Uh, I think it was Larry Wywoody, who's a novelist, mm -hmm. Christian novelist. And I was reading an essay he'd written, actually, not one of his novels. And, and I, I, said, I confessed that I realized that uh, when I meet people, uh, it's very tempting for me to kind of try to figure out what arguments they represent. <laughs> Rather than trying to enter into the story of their life and to understand that they are at the point of a narrative also. Uh, I see them as either arguments to nurture and encourage or arguments to rebut. I, I hope I've gotten over some of this. Uh, but I think my native tendency was uh, as an apologist, but an apologist who was, who was principally not about recognizing uh, the, the, the actual situatedness of a person in their own life story. Now, that can go to extremes. Uh, you know, I, uh, people can blog about every detail of their life <laughs> uh, to the point where it, these little micro-narratives uh, uh, really become a real nuisance <laughs> and actually obscure the big story of their life. So I th I, maybe one way that, that, this, that, that the story of our churches can become a more beautiful story, I, I think that's part of what you're asking, is for us to be attentive to, to, to where people are in, their, in, the, in the, the story that God is telling through their life, possibly. Which doesn't, that doesn't mean that, uh, Sometimes people say, well, this is my story, as if it, that what I'm doing and what I want to do is, is above criticism because it's my story. That's not at all what I mean. I assume everyone knows that. that's not at all what I mean. Well, I hope that's a little bit helpful. To, to attend to the story in Scripture, as he was saying, to the story as story, and not to feel this need, as Ken said, to extract a moralizing principle. And then, you know, you don't, people don't do that in their story. They don't look at the story of their lives and say, you know what I need to do? I need to extract a moral principle from this and then analyze it under a microscope. They just live it. So my objective is to take that Old Testament or New Testament narrative story, find the parallels, the similarities, the connecting the dots between the struggle in Israel and the struggle in the life of my contemporaries. C.S. Lewis struggled with this. Uh, he struggled with, as an apologist, and pretty much a left brain guy, he, he even said, before left and right brain studies were in vogue, he said, on the one side of my brain is a many islanded sea of poetry and myth, on the other a glib and shallow rationalism. How did he know that? Mm. How could he intuit that? Well, he was brilliant, uh, for one thing. And then he wrote, Till We Have Faces, and that was his favorite work. That was, his, that was his favorite work because he felt like he melded the two. He let the story function, which is just the Cupid and Psyche myth retold. Uh, it, 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 he, he melded it into and let the story function as story. So it's, it's always a challenge for us who want to exegete the, you know, the, uh, the hair on a flea. We want to you know, extract and reduce and, and then and it deconstruct the rose and then tape it back together and pretend like it's a rose. It's not. It's a, that's, that's a, you know, don't, don't invite people into a morgue. You invite them into a church to see a resurrection. You don't want to show them some, you know, an autopsy on the text. Uh, okay. <laughs> Another question, yeah. Um, one takeaway personally that I've had from your talks is just the concept that we need to relearn how we experience in light of our understanding of who God is. And um, specifically with dualism, I've been thinking about um, with my generation how it really runs so deep in how we view decisions and experiences and kind of the overabundance of, um, of options and the mm. instant gratification culture kind of has devalued meaning and really anything. And it, I've realized for me personally, I think a lot of my um, peers, it makes our, the way that we look at life as though there is a distinction between spiritual and physical when it comes to our decisions and that there are 
um, options as far as food, music, art, mm. film, and activities, and mm. books, and how we spend our time mm. that don't have any meaning and that God is not part of that. And I've just kind of been feeling that that's a really big problem in general with how we just interact with life. And I was curious what your opinion is about, is there a distinction at all um, between really minuscule things and how we decide of what toothbrush we buy, for example, mm. or, um, you know, if, as we get that small, but really how do we, how do we help people see how to re-understand our interaction with our decisions yeah. and that distinction? That's, that's a great question. And I think that, uh, I mean, the, the, the overabundance of choices ha has lots of consequences. It, it, it ends up, as you've suggested, um, conveying the sense that none of it matters, uh, first of all. That, that none of these decisions, and that, that, m that much of our life is involved with making meaningless choices. And there's an app for that, so maybe we could, have <laughs> we could avoid it. Um, one of the things that I think that encourages is a sense of irony that is very destructive. Um, and a kind of, I mean, I remember the first time I saw a t-shirt that said, whatever. Um, that's actually a, a, a sensibility that is very, very destructive, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, and it's not that, it's not that we want to regard every decision as, as, as fraught with ultimate consequence. Uh, and yet, uh, there are, uh, again, if, if we think about Building a life that has a shape to it and a uh, a kind of coherence and uh, and a beauty about it, um, and uh, uh, another metaphor would be a, a, a kind of adequate rhythm to it, rather than um, just living life piecemeal. Um, that's very hard. There are a lot of forces against us. Not just, <clears throat> not just intellectual forces. You know, I realized, I, I don't know, some of you will, will be familiar with the de definition probably in the 80s. Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard talks about the postmodern involving the, what is it, the implausibility of metanarrative? Is that the term you, or, yeah. The, the, that is, uh, to be postmodern means that we can't believe that there's a big story that explains reality. And I've, you know, I've heard that for years and read various critics and uh, enthusiasts for postmodernity and postmodernism and thought, well, that's a philosophical position. But only recently have I realized that the reason why many young people, people, let's say, 40 and under, and maybe, maybe even older than that, young people. <laughs> uh, people who've grown up in the late 20th century. Uh, the reason why they find the, the notion that there's a story about all of reality implausible is because their everyday life, the experience of everyday life, there's nothing patterned, there's nothing given, there's, there's no script that they are introduced to that would tell the story of their life. There's, there are very few rituals, there are very few rites of passage that, that, that everybody kind of tells their story their own way, yeah. So, so, th so that in, in the face of that, and that ties very much with your idea of, you know, everything's optional. I would recommend you read a book called, book called Mediated by Thomas de Zengatita. It's D I capital Z E N G O T I T A, and it, it's ostensibly a book of media criticism, mediated how the media affect how we think and feel, or something like that. I can't remember the exact subtitle, but it is one of the best descriptions I've ever read of the sense of futility of what you could call the postmodern spirit. Although I don't think he uses. 
the term postmodern. And a lot of it, it's all about options. In fact, I did an interview with him, and one of the things we focused on was, he said for people, and he's actually a little older than I am, so this is not just young people. <laughs> this is middle-aged people who don't realize, late middle-aged people don't realize that they're not young people anymore. Um, <laughs> But uh, he says um, optionality, everything is, it, when everything is optional, then there is no sense of necessity. And he said, he said, you know, he said, I have friends now who are, you know, they're in their 60s, some, some of their friends have died, and they're facing the possibility of their own death, possibility of their own death, how interesting. <laughs> I might die. That's <laughs> uh, an option. Um, <laughs> And he said, he said, what I find is they're not gripped by fear, they're, they're offended by it because nobody gave them a choice whether or not to die. Uh, that, and, and sometimes I've wondered whether the uh, kind of voluntary euthanasia thing is in part driven, not just by horrible suffering, but by the idea that we want to be choosers right to the very end, we want to choose. So I think that, that, that it is a very destructive mentality. The, the, the answer, I mean, I guess a, a glib answer would be to, to think about lib, living deliberately and living with a kind of, again, a sense of consistent pattern. That okay, we're going to have to stop there. Would you join me in thanking Ken Myers for coming? <laughs> Thank you. Okie doke. We're gonna we're gonna pray and then we will be dismissed. You gonna are you gonna be over in yeah. Mitchell? Okay, great. So he's available for you to visit with. Let's pray and then we'll go. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the fellowship of believers who uh, build one another up, continue to stretch, continue to encourage us to grow. Like Ken, we know that our enemy does not like what's going on here, does not like what the, 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 the kind of thinking that, that Ken is uh, encouraging. So we do pray your protection on him. We pray that you would keep him pure morally, pure uh, intellectually, that you would preserve his ministry and his life for many years to come, and that you would grant him great and increasing influence for the Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray that you would give him uh, dreams and plans that are in, uh, in harmony with those that you have prepared for him and for all of us from before the foundation of the world. Be with each of us now. Help us to carry these uh, words of wisdom out uh, into the marketplace and into the church and to make a difference for our Lord Jesus Christ through the arts and give us good, careful and, and imaginative expression. We pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you all.